Hi guys, this is the second on a series of videos that I'm doing on some tapeworms. So if you want a more complete description of what a tapeworm is, check out the Tania video that has a really good overview of tapeworms. I'll do a short one here, but that'll provide more information and it'll tell you a lot about what to avoid when eating pork and beef. Um, so in this video, we're gonna talk about Diphilobothrium latum. Diphilobothrium latum is one of the largest tapeworms. This thing can be like an alarming length, like yards long, okay? But it is a tapeworm. Um, tapeworms are actually known as cestodes. And because they are a worm, they are also known as helminths, okay? And because they are a eukaryotic multicellular organism, we're also talking about a parasite here, okay? Diphilobothrium latum is the fish tapeworm. So let's get into it. As I said, there's gonna be a more complete discussion of this particular slide in the Tania video. But the thing you wanna keep in mind is that the head is known as the scolex, and it has numerous attachment sites, including four muscular suckers and some hooks. The only caveat to this is actually Diphilobothrium latum. The fish tapeworm, that scolex is equipped with only a pair of long lateral muscular grooves. It lacks these hooklets. So it's kind of used a different method for attaching um, to our intestinal tract. Um, the individual segments are still called proglottids and they still get more mature the further we get toward the end of the tapeworm. It's still a hermaphroditic organism and at toward the end, we've got a full uterus full of eggs at, in these more distal proglottids. Okay, so physiology and structure of Diphilobothrium latum. So this is actually a Diphilobothrium latum that was removed from a patient. And you can just see how incredibly massive this particular tapeworm is. Um, it can be 20 to 30 feet long. It's insane. Um, it's called the fish tapeworm. Why? Well, it has two intermediate hosts. Both are found in freshwater. So freshwater crustaceans and freshwater fish. Um, I currently live in Chicago. Um, I grew up on Long Island, so love seafood. Absolutely love it. That is not freshwater fish. That is saltwater fish because it comes from the ocean. Moving out here, um, I'm told the Midwest has lots of wonderful fish to eat, but it's not my saltwater fish that I know and love. And now I actually have a great excuse for why I won't eat it, and it's Diphilobothrium latum because that is all freshwater fish worms. It's highly unlikely. I'm sure that the fishing industry in Chicago is wonderful. Um, okay, but what are our infective forms? How do we actually get it? Um, when we think about this, your infective form is something called the sparganum, okay? This is a larval worm that's found in the flesh of the freshwater fish. So we don't tend to contract this from the crustacean. We actually tend to contract it from the fish, okay? So when we think about the structure, I want you to think of the scolex of D. latum as like a lance. And it has these long lateral grooves that kind of attach to the body. Um, the proglottids, you can see, are actually pretty wide. I mean, look at how big this proglottid is. Um, the adult worms, because of this kind of amount of space, are able to produce eggs for months to years, and they can produce more than 1 million eggs per day in the fecal stream. I mean, that is a mind boggling amount. Um, a fully developed egg will then be ingested by the crustacean. The crustacean is then eaten by the fish. Big fish eats littler fish. Big human eats little fish. Um, so the crustacean is eaten by the fish where the parasite continues to develop into the sparganum. The sparganum is then transferred into this fresh fish. We then eat the fish. We see this one worldwide. Um, and actually fish aren't the only places that we can get it from. There's actually a reservoir for this in a bunch of different animals and they're all animals that eat fish. So bears, minks, walruses, canines, felines, any of these creatures that eat fish, including us, could potentially have this tapeworm in it. So that means any of us who would potentially hunt these animals, hopefully not canines and felines, but any of us that would hunt these animals and eat the meat of these animals are also opening ourselves up to that. Um, how do we get it? Um, it's generally insufficient cooking, okay? So insufficient cooking could be a lot of different things. Um, over campfires, you know, people love to go on fishing trips and then cook their fish on a campfire. Really gotta make sure 
that meat is done. Um, and then also tasting and seasoning of gefilte fish can also account for many infections. So for those of you that love your gefilte fish, I think that's great. Just make sure you are properly um, preparing it. Okay, like most parasitic infections, this one is typically asymptomatic, but occasionally as this worm gets bigger and bigger, because we know it does, people complain of epigastric pain, abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, and weight loss. The other thing, there's been kind of an odd association between Diphilobothrium latum, which is just kind of fun to say, and vitamin B12 deficiency, okay? Um, if you are a carrier of D latum, there's actually a lot more likelihood of vitamin B12 deficiency. Approximately 40% of our Diphilobothrium latum carriers are B12 deficient. Whether or not um, the B12 deficiency actually helps the Diphilobothrium latum carriage or Diphilobothrium latum carriage leads to vitamin B12 deficiency, I'm not really sure. This is kind of a chicken egg scenario, but it is something to think about. Okay, but when we do get infected and when there is a painful reaction, it's referred to as sparganosis, okay? Because remember, the sparganum is what actually infects us. Most often, sparganosis is a painful, intense inflammatory reaction in the eye. Um, that's where it most often happens. It's really, really painful. There's not a lot of space there, and there's a really big worm, um, and it'll lead to periorbital edema. So that's one way of kind of identifying it. So how are we gonna di diagnose it? If you look in the stool, you're gonna see a bile-stained operculated egg with a knob at the bottom of the shell. This isn't showing the knob very clearly. I can see if I can find a better picture, but there may be you know, a small protrusion, okay? Um, typical pro proglottids will have kind of a rosette uterine. Um, so you can see them here. See how they're kind of multi-lobulated? They almost look like little flowers in the proglottid. That's actually the worm's uterus, and they can be found in the stool. The choice is kind of to just remove the sparganum um, surgically, if you can. Um, if you're gonna use a drug, niclosamide is a great choice. You might also try giving some vitamin B12 because we know there's an association with deficiency. And to avoid it, cook your fish. If you cook the fish, you don't have to worry about diphilobothrium latum.